You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Hello, East Tennessee. Welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. You know, understanding investment cycles, market downturns, in addition to market bull markets, and understanding recession and its impact on your retirement investments is a critical topic that has real impacts on many retirees and soon-to-be retirees, especially considering the unpredictable financial climate we're navigating today. A market downturn can be daunting for anyone, but is particularly concerning for those at the threshold of retirement. Market timing, when are in it, specifically when are the good years and when are the bad years, becomes much, much more critical when you transition into retirement and begin drawing money from your life savings. It's not nearly as important when we're younger and we're accumulating money. Over the long haul, the stock market has always produced a very nice inflation-adjusted real return. The question, how much time? Um, but, you know, if you're drawing money, for, if you're drawing income from your investments along the way, the timing of when those bull markets happen and when those bear markets happen can be crucial. And it's a risk you inherit the day that you retire. And we can prepare for that ahead of time. We can prepare for it now if we're already there. You know, managing market volatility is not simple. Your investments need to be properly positioned, so managing risks. If not, market volatility can potentially erase decades of your savings, and if it happens in the first five years of retirement, it can be devastating. So how do we ensure that our investments are fortified against the impact of a recession? How can we navigate the waters that we are in today? And and there's certainly a lot of instability And now we add all the geopolitical risks with what's gone on with uh, Israel and Palestinians and Hamas. And then you add that on top of the Ukraine and then what's going on with China. Um, You know, there's a lot of instability around the world. Uh, But we do know it's very difficult to time markets. We know that market cycles exist. So how do you navigate all this? So that's... That's the, one of the main things we're going to get into on today's show. We'll also talk about the true impact of market volatility on your retirement and that critical understanding of when the good markets happen and when the bad markets happen. And we don't really control that. We don't know what the next five years holds or the next 10 years. Uh, we do know over time, markets, you know, stock market diversified investing is the best way historically to beat inflation on your investments. But in the short term, it's completely unpredictable and you take on a lot of risk. So how do you navigate all this? Um, we'll also talk about real estate as an asset class. It is kind of interesting that real estate investors, as a rule, according to a recent survey, are very optimistic here in the fall of 2023, looking into the end of this year and into next year. However, those same real estate uh, investors who were surveyed are not as confident about the U.S. economy. So how should you be looking at real estate as an asset class uh, in your investment and financial plan? And then finally, we'll have in in those first few years of retirement, 
two things that you might want to save on and not not break the bank, and then three things that it's certainly worth splurging on, especially in those early years of retirement. So that's what we're going to get into today. Uh, let's talk about the impact of market cycles. I mean, if, if you look at everything that can happen economically in the United States and around the world, there's really only four things that can happen to various degrees. Um, either our economy is expanding or contracting and everything in between. And then we have inflation, we have deflation, and everything in between. So that's really all that can happen. Now fundamentally, I believe very, very strongly that we don't know when one cycle is going to end and another cycle is going to begin. As an example, almost nobody saw growth stocks doing well in 2023. And yet, the seven magnificent seven stocks, those seven big companies, Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple and Tesla, several others, they're responsible for 97% through the first, through the, through September 30th, they're responsible for 97% of our stock market gains this year. Well, people didn't really see that coming as a rule. Markets are just completely unpredictable. But we know there's all, those four things are really all that can ultimately happen. We do know that regardless of what happens in those economic cycles, there are going to be asset classes, that some that perform better than others. Or another way to look at that, there are some that are going to perform worse than others. Now, over long periods of time, the U.S. stock market has historically been the best way to beat inflation. But that's in the long term. In the short term, it, it brings up tremendous amounts of unpredictability and volatility because we don't know when one cycle is going to end and one is begin. So how do we look at today's climate? Is a recession coming? You know, many experts do believe it's coming, but, but, but many experts believe it is not coming. You know, it's interesting that the economic data has continued to remain resilient in the face of higher interest rates. Inflation has continued to be persistent as people are spending money. And a lot of that is due to wage inflation. People are making more money so they can spend more money. Um, we, we don't know the answer. It's it, Last I saw about a month ago, it's about a 50-50 mix of economists that think we will see recession versus we won't see recession. My comments on that is I think it is increasingly likely that the Fed will get their soft landing, but I also think it's increasingly likely they're going to hold interest rates higher and for a longer period of time than expected. And I think that's why in September and October we've seen a market decline. The way that we have is the realization that the Fed is going to hold rates higher. So at some point, the thought is that will affect economic growth and could trigger recession. So inflation and interest rates and the Fed and their policy in response to that is the main thing that's, that's driving that, in my opinion. Uh, now, what are the long-term effects of a potential recession? Typically, we see increases in unemployment, and we see a widening in income inequality in a recession. However, just let, let's say we do have, let's say we said, hey, in the next six to nine months, we're going to see recession, mild to moderate recession. Does that mean the stock market's going to go down? We don't know that. The, the stock market is still down uh, compared to January the 1st of 2022. And then if you throw in that in 2023, those magnificent seven technology growth stocks, you know, the big, big companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple and Amazon, uh, are driving almost all the stock market growth. The reality is most U.S. companies, the market is not in a new bull market. If we look at stripping out those seven companies. 
and 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 so they are down compared to January of last year. So, you know, we have to be very careful. Usually the market bottom comes as much as eight or nine months before we see the start of a recession. So we just never know. Um, that's the thing. Markets are completely unpredictable in the short term. So I think I think one of the keys here is, I'm, I mean, I will go on the record. I, I believe we will see it at, you know, more than likely a mild recession. Um, I could be dead wrong. But that doesn't mean the market's going to go down more. Because the stock market is always looking at where are things going to be in six to nine months, typically. And so it's looking forward, not where we are now, but where we're going. And I think the bottom line here is we know that in the short term, markets are completely unpredictable. We also know that markets are volatile. So we shouldn't be depending on our at-risk stock market type investment portfolio for short-term results. That's really one of the most important concepts in wealth management is understanding the structure of, you know, if you will, think about putting money, all your investments and savings into different kinds of buckets. To, to be simple, let's say one bucket is going to be stuff you need the next five or six years, and the other bucket is stuff you don't need for six or seven years. We shouldn't be depending on risk investments that are volatile and choppy and unpredictable. We shouldn't be depending on them in the short term because we have no idea what they'll do in the short term. And we also shouldn't try to time the short term. You know, there's an old saying, time in the market is much, much more important to long-term success than timing of the market. So we need to stay invested. We do need to manage downside risk, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later when we talk about diversification and, and even specifically real estate as an asset class. So we do need to manage and measure, measure and manage risk. But at the same point, we don't want to try to time markets. So the, the, the big takeaway there is don't depend on risk investments in the short term. So if I'm going to buy a car in two years, that money should not be invested in the stock market. I don't know where the stock market will be in two years. It's a crapshoot. If you said, Jim, I'm going to retire next year and I need to draw $25,000 of income from my savings to supplement my other retirement income, well, that $25,000 should not be in the stock market because it's completely unpredictable as to where it'll be next year. So it's so important to understand that at-risk investments, on the one hand, they give you the greatest protection against inflation long term. But in the short term, they're unpredictable and volatile and can't be depended on in the short term. So we need a financial plan that will help you create time in your investment portfolio. And that's harder to do when you get close to retirement. You're retired because you're already going to be drawing income. But you can create time by segmenting your money based on like buckets of money. Okay, so very, very, very important. Now we're going to get to our first break and when we come back we're going to talk about the true impact of market volatility on your retirement. We'll also have more about the next class that you can attend at Pellissippi State Community College, how to thrive financially in retirement. So stay with us. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living, right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm Jim Brogan. I'm your host. And we're talking today about the likelihood of recession and the impact of market volatility and how that, the timing of when the good years happen and when the bad years happen in the markets potentially become much more critical in your retirement years. The problem is we don't control markets. We don't control what happens, especially in the short term. So we need a plan to mitigate the impact of short-term market volatility. 
I will say, um, Mississippi State is having their next class, Thrive Financially in Retirement. And it's, it's going to be at their Hardin Valley location. It is this Tuesday. T- it's two successive Tuesday evenings. So it's the 17th and the 24th, 6.30 p.m. The course fee is $59 for a single, and for a married couple, it's $89. And it's free parking over there at the Hardin Valley location. We're going to talk about seven key areas that really will, I think, have to be addressed by most people when they plan for a successful retirement. Whether you're there or you're thinking you might be in there in the next five or six years, this class would be for you. You can go to PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com for more information, uh, and you can download a syllabus. You can also click to register. Uh, I'd love to see you there. Again, it's this Tuesday, uh, the 17th and the 24th, two two two-hour sessions, and we're going to get into all seven of those key areas. I'd love to see you there. I do want to mention uh, also the University of Tennessee is offering a one-night Tax Planning in the New Age, and it is on November the 2nd, which is a Thursday. I'll be teaching that class. Again, Tax Planning in the New Age. Again, for, for, to find out more about that, just go to my website, broganfinancial.com, and you can click on Classes, and you can get information on all of our upcoming classes. Now, the impact of market volatility on your retirement may be the most overlooked yet critical aspect of retirement planning. We know there's no way to predict the future of markets, especially in the short term, but it doesn't mean there's no way to protect your finances against the reality of short-term market volatility. So let's explore how volatility can affect your financial stability in retirement and share strategies to help protect your hard-earned savings from that unpredictability. First, we've just got to understand market volatility. Market volatility is a normal part of investing for the long term. There is no way to perfectly predict market movements, and over time, we know downturns happen. We have bear markets, but we also have bull market runs. And when you wash those all out over the long term, markets provide a good inflation-adjusted real return. The question is how much time? Uh, Does that mean five years? Does it mean 15 years? Does it mean 20 years? That depends on how aggressive you are with your investments. All right, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. But it's, it's important to understand the impact of market volatility in the retirement phase itself. So I'm going to tell you a story about two brothers. Both brothers retired at age 62 years old. They both retired with a million dollars, and they needed to draw $50,000 a year from that million. They needed 50000 of income to supplement their Social Security and any other income sources that they had. So that's a 5% distribution rate, right? 50000 out of a million. Now, that's a high distribution rate for someone 62. I would not recommend that. Doesn't mean it's completely undoable. Uh, Means the way you structure income strategy is going to have to have some flexibility. Uh, But 5% typically be too high. We'd really rather keep that under 4 or even under 3.5. But the point is they they, they started drawing 50,000 a year as their need. And then every year they needed to increase that income because of inflation, cost of living. So they both retired at age 62. They both retired with a million dollars. They needed the same amount of income adjusted for inflation over time. And they had the same investment plan, and it was that classic 60-40 mix of stocks and bonds. You know, it's, it's really come under fire a lot in the last year and a half especially in 2022, the blend of 60-40 stocks and bonds was the worst year since the Depression, where that mix lost over 16%. If you were just 60% in the S&P 500 and 40% in the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index, you'd have been down 16% last year. So it's come under fire, and I think in today's world, the 60-40 mix 
is just probably not enough diversification. But at any rate, that's the most common approach we see. So they, they, both these brothers did the same thing, same financial needs, same amount of money, same investment plan, but they ended up with two very, very different results. Brother number one retired in 1962. That was when he turned 62. Brother number two retired when he turned 62 in 1965. So the only difference in these two brothers was the year that they retired. Brother number one left a wealthy estate, had a great retirement, left a wealthy estate for his family. Um, <coughs> excuse, excuse me. Brother number two ran out of money financially destitute and broke in his early 80s. And again, the only difference <coughs> is the year that they retired. So the only difference was their market timing. See, there was a big rally in the stock market in 63 and 64 right after brother number one retired. So he made a lot more money than he needed for income. And then the 70s was a really tough decade. We had the bear market of 73, 74. We had the hyperinflation of the late 70s. So think about this. The money cratered in 73 and 74, but with hyperinflation, the income need was going through the roof. So he just was taking out too much income compared to his life savings, the, the one that retired in 1965. Brother number one, even though the 70s hurt him, he had made so much when he first retired in the run-up in the stock market in 1963 and 64, it didn't, it didn't have an impact on his longevity. Well, you know, that first five to seven to eight years is so critically important if you risk too much of your investment to market correction, you may be forced to sell or withdraw investments during market lows. And all of a sudden, you've bought high and sold low. And that's the opposite of investing best practice. This can then compound your losses. That money will never, ever come back because it's been spent. So one of the key components here you do not want to, sh to spend an investment loss. Shares of an investment are down in value. You need income. You sell it off, and you spend that money. It's okay to sell when it's down and reinvest it, but you never want to sell it and spend it. And that is a fundamental rule, and that goes back to what I said earlier in the first uh, segment, that we don't know when market cycles are going to, one's going to stop and one's going to begin. We don't know what the future holds, especially in the short term, markets are unpredictable. So we shouldn't be depending on those risk investments for our short term income needs. Okay, now if you own some stock and it pays dividends and you want to live on the dividend yield, that, that can be a viable income strategy to include as part of your income plan. What you don't want to do is have to sell shares of the stock for short-term income because inevitably they're probably going to be down at some point and then you'll have to sell them when they're down and spend that money as an, as a, and as an expense. And that's what we've got to stay away from. So that goes back to understanding that market investments, you've got to have that money where you don't need to live on it for at least five to seven years. Now, the other part is preparing that same risk portfolio for volatility. You need a robust portfolio diversification strategy to mitigate risk. And that 60-40 mix of stocks and bonds, in my opinion, is just not going to be enough in the future. And it certainly hasn't been productive in the last couple of years. Diversification across different asset classes, sectors, risk profiles, geographic locations, can cushion you against severe market downturns. Now, an effective way to protect that is to have your risk measured and evaluated. And, and here's the good news. Risk, measuring risk in a portfolio, now that's what you're really doing is you're taking a mix of investments and you're looking historically at what's happened in the past with those investments from a risk perspective, not a return perspective, from a risk perspective. In other words, when markets are down, if the stock market's down 30%, how much are you likely to be down? 
If the market's up 30%, how much are you likely to be up? Believe it or not, measuring historic risk is a pretty good predictor of future risk. Not what are markets going to do in the short term, but when markets go down, what can you expect? And when markets go up, what can you expect? We can get a pretty good idea. Now, as we know, markets ultimately are unpredictable. You may sometimes get a short-term result that's a little bit you know, different than what you were expecting. But you can have a pretty good idea of what that risk looks like when markets are down and when markets are up. What we don't know is when that's going to happen and by how much. Okay, so we can have a plan that over a period of six or seven years, we have more diversification. We don't have as much downside risk because instead of only owning two or three things like stocks and bonds, we're going to own nine or 10 or 11 different things like I mentioned real estate, commodities, natural resources, energy, um, non-traditional bonds that can go up with rising rates rather than down. Foreign bonds. Foreign bonds are a great way to hedge the dollar. When the dollar goes down, bonds in foreign countries do pretty well because those, you know, if if the, if the, if their currency is is strengthening against the dollar. So if you go back to what I was talking about earlier with these four economic cycles, we're either expanding or contracting and everything in between, and then we have inflation or deflation and everything in between. Fundamentally, we don't know when the next one's going to happen. What we do know is if you own 10 or 11 things instead of only two or three, it's more likely that no matter what markets do in the short term, you're going to have some things that are doing pretty well in your portfolio. So that means when markets are down substantially, you have some things in the portfolio that are doing pretty well or holding their own. So think of them as you've got different hedges in your portfolio. So you don't lose as much. Now, the flip side is when markets boom and we have a three year boom, you're going to have a few things in your portfolio that aren't doing as well. Okay, so you're not going to make as much in the in the boom. But we can measure pretty successfully an expectation of how much of that volatility do you want to participate in. If the market's down substantially, do you want to lose 70 to 80 percent of it? Do you want to lose 40 to 50 percent of it? How much volatility can you experience and, and, and be successful in the long term? But the more hedges you, you add into your portfolio, the more you are going to be giving up potential in the boom. But you can make calculated decisions about that. Now, just always be aware you can always get something out of the norm. You can get, always get an anomaly. And as a good rule of thumb, the shorter the amount of time something crazy happens, the more likely you are to get a, a result that could be different than what you were expecting. Over time, those things balance out. All right. As an example, in March of 2020, when the pandemic hit, our stock market went down 35% in four weeks. You, from the market high to the market low in four weeks in March. And... You know, typically a bear market takes six to nine or even 12 months to go from the market to low. It went from market high to low in four weeks, but then it came back in a few months. Usually it takes two or three years to come back. So it was, you know, diversification. You know, even with great diversification, you would have participated probably a little bit more in the downturn, but then also a little bit more in the recovery than would normally be expected. That's just kind of an example. But we just have to be aware that we can always get a little bit of an unpredictable outcome. But measuring risk is a pretty good predictor of future risk. So you can take calculated risks. And then as important as anything, you don't get a big surprise, hopefully, uh, not a big surprise of what your how your money's likely to behave in different markets. What we don't know is when they're going to happen. But if you've planned for it ahead of time, you're less likely to panic. And as I said earlier, time in the market is much more important than your timing of the market because we just don't know when rallies and busts are going to happen. So number one, you don't want to live on market investments in the short term. 
because they're unpredictable and you don't want to sell and spend an investment loss. And then number two, measure the risk in your portfolio and have greater diversification provides more stability because you've got more things that zig and zag, right? That's what diversification really means. If one thing zigs, another thing zags. That way, if one thing like stocks is way down, hopefully they're not all way down. But then the, 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 the flip is true. When stocks are way up, you're not going to be up as much. So you just have to make calculated decisions. Now, about diversification, I get asked a lot about real estate investment. Real estate as an asset class is, in my opinion, a fundamental part of wealth management. But there are different ways to invest in real estate. And what do those pros and cons look like? Stay with us. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. You're listening to News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're with you every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. And again, from 3 to 4 p.m., you can check out all of our podcasts. A couple of ways. Go to BroganFinancial.com, click on radio. You can also use your uh, Spotify or Apple, Apple uh, podcast uh, to listen and download our podcasts. We have our uh, financial, sh- all of our shows. Then, of course, our Retirement Minute segments that run every week on this station, and then also our dollars and cents segments. So just a plethora of information. We've also got resources and tools that can help you plan for the best years of your life and increase the likelihood you're going to be successful, even amidst a lot of economic turmoil. And we sure are facing a lot of that right now. And now we've added in the extra geopolitical events that have just worsened around the world. Now, I'm talking about managing short-term risk and the importance of that, especially uh, when you approach retirement and retire. And we talked about diversification, owning more things that if one thing zigs, another zags. Well, real estate is, in my view, a fundamental asset class that should be part of your investment plan. Now, I don't mean owning 1% or 2% of your portfolio in real estate. That's just not enough to really make much of a difference. If you don't have at least 4 or 5% of your investment portfolio tied in some way to the real estate category, it's just not going to make much of a difference. Now, in terms of a diversification hedge, what you may not be aware of is if we look at U.S. real estate and especially global real estate, it is not as correlated with the stock market as you may think. In other words, if the stock market's up, real estate is up. If the stock market's down, real estate's down. That's that's not as true. It is somewhat correlated, but it's not as correlated as you may think. So in other words, real estate can sometimes zig when the stock market zags, which provides more diversification. So if the stock market's down, real estate may not be down as much. Now, real estate is an asset class is choppy. It's not. I wouldn't say it's as risky as the stock market because it doesn't have that type of risk. But it it definitely is on the more risky side of asset classes, and that would include if you own local real estate. Uh, you know, if you own properties, there's risk there. I mean, that is not a, a guaranteed, safe, stable investment. It's not the same kind of risk as stock market risk. But it does add diversification. So I do believe real estate fundamentally as an asset class should be in your portfolio. Now, there are different ways to do that. The easiest way is to include it in your investment portfolio. You can invest in publicly traded funds, whether they're mutual funds or exchange traded funds or real estate trusts called REITs, publicly traded ones that trade on the market every day. So when you do that, you're passively investing in real estate as a category, and then you're having another company manage that by buying whatever they call real estate, either in the United States or around the world. And there are different ways to focus in on what you want. 
Um, but that's the simplest way, and those, those are liquid ways to invest in real estate, and you passively own the asset class. So you're not having to actively manage anything. It does mean an investment manager is, is drawing a management fee, right? But you're passively investing. Uh, there can be tax advantages to using some of those tools as well. Now, then you can invest privately in those types of offerings like a REIT, a real estate trust, where you may say, Jim, I want to own multifamily in Nashville or maybe in Nashville, Atlanta, and Charlotte or whatever the case, or you want to have storage units, but you don't want to manage it. So you go into a private real estate trust and they do it for you. There are additional tax benefits to that but you've also got a more illiquid investment. And they're not telling you day to day and month to month what that investment is worth. You know, it's not being priced by the market. It's whatever, and it's kind of illiquid. So, you know, a lot of times you have to hold that maybe for 10 to 15 years. And they provide li limited redemption for some investors, but they can freeze that. So there are pros and cons to that. Uh, in terms of liquidity, access, predictability, and it can be deceptive as to what that REIT is actually worth. Now, then you can personally invest in real estate. You know, you could buy property, you could flip houses, you could do rental properties. Um, and this is also a very nice benefit to a diversification strategy. The only thing I'll mention about that, probably or the, one of the biggest things, is be careful because if, you're, if, you're, if you don't have the, the, the proper experience and knowledge of the, of the markets you're buying in, it could be a lot riskier than you realize and could be dangerous. Typically, to become an expert on anything, it takes about a thousand hours of learning. Now, if you're investing in properties in your area where you live, you already have some knowledge, but you probably don't have a thousand hours. So you've got to really be an expert to not get burned. What's the right type of price point to buy a rental? What should your capitalization rate be? In other words, how much gross rent should you charge? If you have a $200,000 property, what should the rent be? And can it bear that? And then what should you be netting? How active do you have to be in the management of that property? Now, that's a rental. The flipping homes, you really have to be careful there, but there are great opportunities. It's interesting, there was a survey uh, it's the Fall 2023 Investor Retirement Sentiment Survey from RCN Capital. 72% of real estate investors believe market conditions for real estate investment are better or the same now as they were a year ago. And 75% believe conditions would either improve or remain stable. But it's the, the flip, fix and flip investors that are most, oper, most optimistic. But the bottom line is you've got to be an expert. And also you should earn money, more money, on an actively managed real estate investment because you're having to invest your time, right? So if I can invest passively in real estate and let's say make a 5% return on rents, uh, versus actively investing in real estate where I'm having to manage properties, well, I need to be making more than 5%. Or if I'm getting 4% on the passive management, I need to make more than that if I'm actively doing it because I should be being compensated for my time. And I think that's something that a lot of real estate investors, when they start thinking about it, they don't really factor that part in. You should make a higher return because you're investing time, and your time and is worth money. So there's different ways to invest in real estate. As I said, the simplest is to use publicly traded vehicles where someone else is managing that real estate portfolio, whether it's real estate stocks or it's REITs or it's, uh, you know, which is real estate trusts or it's cell phone towers or whatever it is. They're doing that for you.
but then your return is probably not going to be quite as high because you're not having to actively put your time into it. But real estate, in my opinion, should be a fundamental part of an investment asset allocation plan. We're going to get to our last break. I don't have much time left, but I do want to mention in that first year of retirement, two things that you may want to focus on saving money on and not overspending, and three areas where you should absolutely splurge on and make sure you spend the money to get what you need. Stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jim Brogan. Check us out online at BroganFinancial.com. We've got a wealth of resources. The first year of retirement, what are two things you should be pinching pennies and saving on and not overspending? And what are three things that you should splurge on? So first off, two things that you should be careful how much you spend. One would be vacations. You know, many new retirees choose to splurge on vacations that they wish they had taken when they were still working. And while travel is a very worthwhile pursuit, it can add up quickly in cost when you consider accommodations, food, excursions, and the actual travel cost. And that might be an area where you might choose to be a little bit more budget conscious is on vacations. Uh, The other would be your cars. You know, some people say a car is a bad investment. I would actually say a car is not an investment. Because an investment is something you do to make money on. And a car is never going to make money. A car is, I wouldn't say never. You could buy, there are some kind of cars, collectibles, things like that. But as a rule, the cars we drive are going to lose money. So they're not an investment at all. They're an expense. So you want to minimize that expense to the degree you need to. Now, many of you can afford to buy luxury cars, and that's fine too. But that is an expense that can definitely be minimized by being smart about how we shop. Now, three things I think you should not worry too much about cost. The first would be your health care. How you handle Medicare, how you handle your supplement or your Medicare Advantage plan. Um, All those things are very, very critically important. If you spend more for richer plans, then you're going to have less in utilization costs. So certainly your medical costs are very, very important. That's not something you want to pinch pennies on. Uh, Number two would be hobbies, passion projects, things you take on that, you know, new hobbies. I think that's tremendous. And then the third would be financial advice. I do think that there are just a lot of layers of complexity in retirement financial planning, and it pays to get professional advice. Speaking of which, my next class through Pellissippi State Community College is the next two Tuesdays coming up here. Uh, That would be on the 17th and the 24th at Pellissippi State Hardin Valley. You can go to PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com for more information. Invest in yourself. $59, two two two-hour sessions. I'm going to cover A to Z, the most important things I think everyone needs to be aware of in their financial retirement planning. We've discussed your wealth today because greater wealth provides for more living so you can live the best years of your life. Have a great week. This is More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.